Right, good morning, everyone. Um, so uh, before getting started, I want to acknowledge that I'm joining you from the land of the Matinikok people, um, and that because we are meeting through Zoom, uh, we must acknowledge um, the Mokwetma Alone people who are uh, on whose land Zoom has erected its headquarters and to pay respect to their elders past, present and emerging. That the infrastructure for international telecommunications is built on and across occupied land is relevant to our topic today as we consider what is lost, missing or what slips between the physical and the digital environments. In Mengele's Skull, the advent of forensic aesthetics, Thomas Keenan and Eil Weissman described the disinterment of a body in Brazil thought to be that of missing Nazi war criminal Joseph Mengele. Detailing the various sciences brought to bear on the corpse to in interrogate it for its evidential value, the authors described forensics as the newest of the forms of testimony considered in war crimes trials. The other two are documents and witnesses. Each of these documents, witnesses, forensics contains space for questions. Is the document authentic? Is the witness trustworthy? Is the science sound? And between them, they make up spaces. That is the space for stories. In Henri Lefebvre's book length list of the lost, missing or never created cultural genius of the world, there are rich uh, possibilities for stories. So even just in this sample here, we could pick out the journal of Anne-Marie Schwarzenbach, destroyed by her mother, or the contents of the phone call between Stalin and Pasternak, all spaces for stories. Story space spans the analog and the digital. Through a digital exhibition curated with Forget Chatterera Zambuco, we have tried to use digital photography and the reach of the internet to draw attention to the calls from many archivists around the world who demand that the UK returns records displaced during decolonization. The missing archives are unavailable now both physically because they've been <clears throat> withdrawn from public access by the UK National Archive and they've never been digitized, which while hugely helpful in many ways, raises a question about the viability of the concept of digital repatriation. If records are more than simple information, what is actually being returned um, in the digitally repatriated? Mimi Onhua's uh, Library of Missing Datasets catalogues datasets that were never created and captured, illuminating how cultural values are represented in absences of care, of data, and of memory. Here we see the GitHub page for this project. And here we see the project's physical instantiation uh, that she made as a, a mixed media installation. These are some of the missing data sets that she has catalogued. So for example, measurements for global web users that take into account shared devices and VPNs, a master database that details if and which Americans are registered to vote in multiple states, and the total number of local and state police departments using st Stingray phone trackers. On Hua writes, Missing data sets are my term for the blank spots that exist in spaces that are otherwise data saturated. My interest in them stems from the observation that within many spaces where large amounts of data are collected, there are often empty spaces where no data live. Unsurprisingly, this lack of data typically correlates with the issue, issues affecting those who are most vulnerable in that context. The word missing is inherently normative. It implies both a lack and an ought. Something does not exist, but it should. That which should be somewhere is not in its expected place. An established system is, disrupt is disrupted by distinct absence, end quote. The archival silence trope is familiar to archivists, yet in the present and inevitably, some lives, experiences and events continue to be ghosted by record making and institutional collecting and preservation. Digital storytelling is one set of techniques that are able um, that are being used to transmit memories into the future. Digital storytelling encompasses a range of formats and methods, from geospatial and timeline data to video essays and podcasts to simple blogs. In the creation of these digital objects, which themselves require preservation, 
digital storytellers can preserve traces of analog or lived culture and experience so that preservation is enacted by and enacted upon digital stories. In a class called Memory Work at the City University of New York, or CUNY, my students and I considered the Holocaust Museum's use of digital identity cards to memorialize Willem Arondius, pictured here on the left, who bombed an Amsterdam government office during the occupation in World War II to destroy the identity cards that uh, were being used by the Nazis to identify Jews. Arondius was executed, but his collaborator, Frida Bellinfante, on the right here, uh, escaped to California, where she would conduct the Orange County Philharmonic. She is not memorialized in a digital identity card at the Holocaust Museum, but leaves other traces. The Wikipedia page on Bellinfante mentions this record, said to be the only surviving recording of her conducting. My students and I have been trying to track down a copy of the record with the intention of digitizing it at CUNY's uh, Archival Technologies Lab. And I just want to uh, play a clip from one of my students describing her work to try and find this record. But after the end of term, I had a lot of free time. I've been contacting different huge organizations to see if they had the recording. Um, the Holocaust Museum, Yad Vashem, Center for Jewish History, and the Lesbian History Archive. Um, none, of these, none of these institutions had the recordings. Um, I was at a shiva several months later when I met a sound conservator who recommended I contact the NYPL's Performing Arts Archive. They again did not have it, but they recommended that I contact the Library of Congress, who again did not have the recording. And then I became really into finding the recording. So then I contacted University of California in Santa Barbara's uh, Performing Arts Collection, Syracuse's Audio Collection, Stanford's Archive of Recorded Sound, Yale's uh, Historical Recordings, and they didn't have it. Um, I also found a person with the, um, who talked about the recording on Wikipedia, and I managed to find their LinkedIn, but no other social media. I messaged them, but they did not respond. And I contacted UCLA, um, where she taught they didn't have the recording, but they did send me the auction record for the recording. I'm now left to wonder if the only existing copy of this record exists in the private collection. And if it's even playable because the recording looked pretty, just looked pretty well from the images I saw. Simultaneously, as we're doing this work, um, we're using digital storytelling to document the process. In particular, we're working with the desktop documentary format, which uses the space of the laptop screen as a lens. Within the confines of the screen, using the affordances of digital objects and interfaces from videos recorded on Zoom, such as this one, to screen captures of browsing the web, the technologies that are most readily available to us, but which are all fragile in their own ways, become the means for perpetuating traces of Frida. And with that, I'll stop and hand over to Jamie Lee. Thank you. Thank you and good morning. Let me just share my screen. Da, da, da. All right. So thank you all for being here today. And I'd also like to thank all of those whose names we don't know, whose labors went into preparing and producing this year's iPres conference and our online session. And thank you to our hosts and also to James Lowry for organizing the session. Um, I'm speaking today from the traditional homelands of the Tana Atam, whom I acknowledge as the original caretakers of the land. And I acknowledge too the Pascua Yaqui and Yoeme and offer a deep honoring to all indigenous people who've been and are a part of this land. All righty, here's the big thing. Mm -hmm. Click, oh, there we go. <clears throat> so my research in trans is transdisciplinary and um, as Kai said, centers archival studies, critical archival studies, storytelling in the body. And I like to think about the crux of my work as multimodal memories. And in my talk, I'll share the digital storytelling project that continues to grow and take on new shapes since its inception in 2006. 
My focus is on stories and especially how I've come to understand bodies, places, and archives as stories so far. Storytelling and digital storytelling exist in relation and becoming and become embodied, <clears throat> remembered, and preserved in these ways. I consider storytelling a methodology in my work as a scholar, an archivist, and an activist. <clears throat> so following Sandra Harding, I understand methodology and method as related and distinct terms. Methodology is both a theory and an analysis of how research does and should proceed, and method is a technique for gathering evidence. And this understanding informs my development of what I call the queered archival methodology, which at first glance may seem mismatched insofar as it brings together queer theory and archival theory. And I say mismatched because queer theory is a theory of unhinging taken for granted and reductive assumptions, while archival theory is focused on a sort of persistence and fixity. So I mean for the queered archival methodology to guide archivists through processes of archiving in ways that make room for the unfixed and the persistently unsettled. And such an approach allows for the framing of archives as sites of becoming and sites of, of stories so far. And the archives understood this way can be seen and experienced as dynamic sites, sites for living, perhaps also shifting knowledges. And such living archives are perfect for digital stories to be both preserved and remembered, and also practice and remembered through embodied productions. So I began my work in archives as a documentary filmmaker. Stories and storytelling are at the heart of my life's work. Films and media are constituted by and invite the affective, the sensual, and our personal stories. And as producers and audiences, we bring our lived histories and lived knowledges as embodied into our experiences of watching, listening to, and feeling the media. And we experience things together in audiences and on the couch with our family and friends and alone on our computers with our headphones. Multimodal media experiences. Me. Pardon sorry me? to interrupt. Really sorry, but um, I think maybe you might, might want to show your slides in full screen mode. And um, these pictures are, are, are great, but we can't see the details. So I'm only asking, right? Hmm. Because right now we can see the preview mode of your uh, uh, okay. PowerPoint. Is that better? Yes, marvelous. Much better. Okay. Thank you. Okay, sorry about that. So, um, F, let's see, what am I on? What number five? So, multimodal media experiences in and through our sensual knowledges are deeply rooted in affective methodologies. Now let's turn to the project itself. So in 2006, I collaborated with my partner Adela and her brother, a science pedagogue from El Paso, Texas, um, to start the documentary feature film called Agua Miel Secrets of the Agave. And we centered the agave in the name because it is the indicator species of the Chihuahua Desert. And our film work focused on the US-Mexico borderlands where Texas, New Mexico, and Northern Chihuahua, Mexico meet. Our film participants and collaborators shared their experiences and how they knew and understood their lands and their histories together. Effectively, they told stories of deep lived knowledges and lived histories of their lives and their parents' lives, their grandparents. They shared long histories and sensual knowledges and understandings of place and time. The guiding principles of our early film work continue to influence the digital storytelling project today and include decolonizing methodologies, which an approach to documenting that emerges from within community contexts and is informed by community interests and needs as defined by community. It's relational, critically conscious, and change-oriented. Social justice media that is interested in social change, produced as a gesture of solidarity with community members and activists, and as a way to share and circulate lived insights, commitments to justice, and hope. Public and participatory practices that join intellectual work with public consequence. And lastly, funds of knowledge a concept based on the belief that people are knowledgeable and competent and that their life experiences are valid and valuable. So now I'll share just a short segment from the film project and hopefully it will play fine. So here we go.
La misma vida nos puede decir mucho si ponemos atención con respeto y dignidad. Okay, today the project is called Secrets of the Agave, a climate justice storytelling project, and it centers everyday stories from the U.S.-Mexico borderlands, and we re-envisioned it as a digital humanities project that could continue to grow as we connected with more and more communities along the U.S.-Mexico border from Texas to California and Chihuahua, Sonora, and Baja California. Secrets of the Agave is a working model for fostering interactions, lessons, and solutions across local and transnational contexts. It features everyday experts as primary resources in identifying, collectively combating, and reimagining climate change through practices of ecological and community sustainability. Secrets of the Agave centers on climate justice, which insists on a shift from a discourse on greenhouse gases and melting ice caps into a civil rights movement with people and communities most vulnerable to climate impacts at its heart. Secrets of the Agave embodies a sense of justice and is an avenue for preserving our local lived and living histories. Um, people of color and those experiencing poverty along the borderlands are disproportionately affected by climate change and climate change mitigation policy. Their everyday stories, experiential, traditional, and sensual knowledges, however, are missing from the data. Their presence is only based on deficit-driven demographics. So this project offers their distinct cultural perspectives that offer, fortify, animate, and complicate the data sets. And inspired by artist and researcher uh, Mimi Anoa, who argues, quote, that which we ignore reveals more than what we give our attention to. It's in these things that we find cultural and colloquial hints of what is deemed important. Spots that we've left blank reveal our hidden social biases and indifference, unquote. So this project actively intervenes in those indifferences. So for the project, we co-create this work. We revise the project. We work in and with communities and our aim is to keep building and do it together. So as I expanded, as I expand and grow the Secrets of the Agave Climate Justice Storytelling Project, I'm building on both my early film work as well as my collaboration with Tracy Osborne from the University of California Merced to design and build the Climate Alliance Mapping Project. Tracy and I worked closely with a team of graduate researchers from her public political ecology lab and my digital storytelling oral history lab. And we first built the Amazon map and then designed the USA map with layers of energy infrastructure, as well as hazardous spills. And you can see uh, this USA map in the lower right with all the layers visible. Um, and then there's a way that you can click off the layers and select which areas you want to dive more fully into. And I mention the spills because we worked closely with the University of Arizona's creative writing program to create the spill stories through which creative writers identified a spill on the map and they reviewed the technical reported data about what happened with the spill and then they created a fuller humanistic story about what happened and it was a way of animating the the data through you know fiction writers creative nonfiction, and also poets and now here is a sample from what Alison Deming a creative writer um, her reading at a story the launch event held in Tucson um, so I'm going to click that Drag racing to the end of the world. I don't blame the men. Jamie, we've lost sound. I think um, you need to keep your mic. himself against man and machine. Their town is any town. Walmart, Chili's, Buffalo Wild Wings, AMC, Sanctuary Golf Course. Subdivisions fill design schemes that make New Lenox look from the air like a toy town. The homes so tidy and simultaneous. For entertainment, pick a favorite brand of car chase or pick them all. Bullet, Mad Max Fury Road, Blues Brothers, Smokey and the Bandit, Fast and Furious, Thelma and Louise, gone in 60 seconds. For brew and burgers, Arrowhead Ales Brewing Company and Bulldog Ale House. No one thought much about the pipeline. It was just another feature of the landscape, 
much of it underground and forgotten. And roads that flat and straight were all about invitation. Two men died and three more were injured in the fiery car crash at 2 a.m. Saturday morning, March 3rd, 2012. I don't think they realized the road ended, said a spokeswoman for the fire district, after two cars drove through a chain link fence and hit the oil pipeline, causing the fatal explosion. The men who died were riding in a Ford Mustang, their car trapped under the pipeline. Firefighters had to stand watch for six hours to make sure another explosion didn't occur. If they moved the car, it could cause a spark, which would cause another explosion. So they watched as the car and the men burned and burned. Horrible, 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 said the sheriff. There was no more to be said, though yes, the three men in the trailblazer escaped and jumped back over the fence that the two vehicles had plowed through. Two suffered severe burns from the waist down. The third made it home that night. All five men were residents of New Lenox, Illinois, and in their 20s. One of the deceased had just completed training as a firefighter. At the hospital, the survivors told police the five had been out drinking at a nearby bar before they decided to head east on Old Plank Road to the dead end straightaway beside the industrial park. So you can visit the link here at Terrain, uh, which published all of the spill stories after the launch event. Um, and you can also visit www.secretsoftheagave.com in the coming months to watch for the creative writers the videos being posted in the digital archives. And uh, Secret to the Agave a story, is a storytelling and archives project that brings together an informational website and educational modules, community-centered recetas or recipes, alongside a distinct archives platform that is expandable to archive and preserve stories and media produced through other borderland storytelling projects that center climate change and the far-reaching effects of climate justice. With funding from the Agnes Hill uh, Nelms Howry Program for Environment and Social Justice, I'm in the process of building the website, which I mentioned, secretsoftheagave.com, which should be launched later this fall. And with funding from the Digital Borderlands Initiative at our university's libraries, I'm working with a team of graduate students to design and build the participatory archives in Omica, an open source content management system. And I'm working in coalition with community teaching partners and design justice experts who are all committed to co-creating educational modules that lift community voices and visions and can be broadly accessible across technological devices in school and community classrooms and other local contexts. And you can also visit the storytellingproject.io for updates on this project and others that my team and I are working on. So thank you so much for having me today and I look forward to um, hearing any questions after the talk. Thanks, Jamie. That was amazing. Um, I'm going to now play uh, Sirita's video. So Sy Sirita Gates has made a film about the work she's doing to preserve hip hop culture here in in Queens and New York. Um, sorry. Sorry, one second. I mean, only now do I know we actually made an impact. And I say that because we didn't do very basic things that you should do if you want to preserve a culture, or if you want to be the person who defines what the culture is and who tells you what was actually happening, you can't do ridiculous stuff. So we did ridiculous stuff. Well, not we, I mean, some of the people who had power did ridiculous stuff. This was the second time I've had to reclaim my property from you. It belongs in a museum. So the Egyptians say that this artifact was stolen from them in the 1970s. World famous auction house Christie's. They were sent to the museum for assessment, along with a cardboard box from Iraq. 
which contained a hoard of clay tablets looted in the wake of the American invasion and inscribed with the earliest known forms of writing. The majority of the loot made its way to Europe, ending up in the possession of private collectors and royal families. Queen Victoria of Britain was even gifted the very first pet Pekingese dog ever seen in Europe, which she brazenly named Looty. Over time, many of these Chinese relics, Looty not included, made its way to museums across Europe, including the Jotningholm Palace in Stockholm, the Coda Museum in Bergen, and the Chateau de Fontainebleau in Paris. Oh, so I want to get you guys from the cover of the Rolling Stones magazine. You guys are like Mick and Keith. I'm like, what the fuck is Mick and Keith, nigga? Fuck the Rolling Stones magazine, nigga. I want to be on the Source magazine cover, nigga. Do you know that is hip-hop supremacy? I've always loved history, especially my own, feel me? My family is certainly the bridge between history and hip hop. All right, y'all, let me break this down so it can forever and continuously be broke. So my grandmother was born in 1926, a part of the Great Migration. She moved from North Carolina to Harlem, USA. My mom came through the door in 1950. My uncles were born at the top and the bottom of 1968. Them, along with my big cousins, were my introduction into the culture. Whoever thought that hip hop would take us this far. Word on the street is that there is indeed something in the name. My name is Sarita Cassandra Gates. I have a few titles that I go by, but I am indeed an archivist. And I'm from Southside Jamaica, Queens, baby, you heard me? Do you want me to tell you who's really representing putting Queens on the map? Today, there's a new epidemic. I was born in what some may say was the greatest year in hip-hop, 1988. Which is crushing its users. The job ahead of us is very clear. Say yes to your life. And when it comes to drugs and alcohol, just say no. My unk, Mr. Greg the Great Tate, was also writing about hip-hop in 1988. So in 2012, Greg Tate comes to speak for my Black popular culture class. And of course, I asked him the question that I've been pondering. Who tells the story of the journalists when they're the ones telling everyone else's story? He says you. All right, cool, cool, cool. I started writing journalism when I was at Howard University in the 70s. So I was a journalist. And when I started writing for the Village Voice in, the 19, in around 1981, uh, I considered myself a music journalist. Um, the notion of a specifically hip hop journalist, I think came into vogue, you know, maybe 10, 15 years after I started writing. We created enough of a, of a dent or a space, a platform that, um, you know, Dream Hampton, and Harry Allen and Karen Good and um, uh, Scott Polson Bryan, and, uh, you know, Selwyn Hines and, you know, all these other folks came, you know, there was, they were readily embraced, you know, at the, at the voice. You know, like, I remember reading Albert Murray, and I remember reading Nelson George, Greg Tate. I remember reading Joan Morgan. I remember reading Dream Hampton and Danielle Smith. I remember being out with Kevin and Scott. Some kid came up to us and said, I want to do what you guys do. I want to be a hip hop journalist. And we all looked at each other like, what the fuck is a hip hop journalist? Like, we were writers, you know? For us, um, we weren't even really aware of the fact that we were forging the way in a new kind of journalism. That's how new um, it was. And once we had the title, we had to sort of figure out, well, what is this and what makes it different from any other kind of journalism? There weren't that many women doing what I do. There literally is a handful of us. Sheena and Danielle and myself and Dream and Kierna, um, you're talking about very self-possessed, woman-centered identities. Dream is one of my closest friends. She uh, was a game changer in that she shaped what hip-hop journalism 
was at the time and would become in the future. And by that, I mean the injection of a clear and pronounced feminist ideology and identity um, as a black woman who was talking about a music that we were creating and shaping and um, c consuming. of ceremonies. You told me no when I asked if you were willing to be filmed for shaping the culture, but I learned from you. Please be consider. Have you ever wondered what music would sound like if you took the bass melodies, gave them to the drums, or took the drum melodies and gave them to the horns? <laughs> Um, basically, it began as a newsletter that was designed to promote our WHRB College Boston Hip Hop Show. Dave had the idea to take, pick up the phone and get everyone's name and address that's calling and write it down. By the end of a couple months, we had thousands and thousands of names and addresses. And that became the first sort of asset of the Source magazine. That's when Dave published a one-page newsletter that was that was called The Source. Gosh, I was really excited when The Source came on because they were just able to get much closer to this music than I ever got. They were writing from within the culture, which was something I couldn't do uh, and, and never really tried to pretend I could do. So I thought you, and then you had this great group of people that came up at that time. And that was the first time that I was able to actually sit in a room with other writers, you know, and, and that was very, very serious because it was scary. That was not something that I was actually accustomed to. And it, it was intimidating because any other time when I'm in the room with other writers, being a graffiti writer, we either going to write or we're going to fight. That's it. Bones was the first person I'd ever read that spoke in the manner that I did out loud, but on paper. And on top of that, he was articulate and he had the, the space to use big words. Um, and I took that cue. I, I started writing for the Source magazine when it first moved to New York in 1989. As soon as I got the Source, all of a sudden I had all this context and I had a, I had a much deeper understanding, which in turn unlocked a deeper appreciation. Uh, for the music, but also made me so grateful to the writers and the editors that put this thing together because they were giving me the blueprint. The source was more gritty, underground, straight hip hop. It like it, you knew what you were gonna get. You knew like if the new Red Man was coming out, you was just gonna get the new Red Man in depth story. He's going to find out everything about him. Um, he's going to get the mics. He's going to get those mics, man. Those mics meant a lot. What happened was Dave decided to put an article in an issue of The Source about a group that he was managing called Almighty RSO. Um, Dave, for whatever reason, decided to insert an article in the magazine without telling me, James, Chris Wilder, or anybody else on the editorial side, a huge violation. And it basically changed the course of the magazine's history um, because in the aftermath of that, the entire staff decided to walk out. 
on the editorial side. James Bernard wrote a letter to Dave about this incident. Boom, the entire rap industry received this crazy inside baseball letter, which is basically like James writing to Dave. I know what you did. It was just a code to punch in the facts and it would go to the entire industry. Later, Dave tried to, you know, put this image of me out there, faxing it one at a time to 500 people. But no, I mean, this woman and I, we, she punched a code in, we put the letter through, and then she and I went to dinner. <laughs> the editorial staff of my squad um, had voted against them being, I think, on the cover or even like a feature story that was, you know, in the magazine because they felt that they didn't deserve that yet. Dave Mays had slipped it into the magazine after the magazine was sent to the printers. And so uh, we were completely uh, blindsided by that. And we're hoping that, that he wouldn't be able to put out the next issue of the magazine um, without all of his staff writing. But uh, some scabs got involved. He hired a couple of people and uh, they were ultimately able to put out the magazine and uh we lost our jobs a friend and mentor to me said can you do me a favor if you got any modern ideas i need to have them now because with the relationship between time and Warren, we haven't got to the 50,000 feet yet. In 92 or 93, there was interest expressed via Russell Simmons that Quincy Jones and Time Warner wanted to start a hip hop magazine and they wanted to look at buying the source and they wanted to maybe do it with the source. So Russell reached out to us and the four principal owners, me, Dave Mays, James Bernard, and Ed Young, traveled to Beverly Hills, California, and ended up in Quincy Jones's house. And they made an offer, but it was not a good offer. They actually offered some very small amount of money, relatively speaking, a small amount of money, and they wanted us to come work for them. And we wouldn't own anything. And we just basically rejected it um, pretty fast. And if Rolling Stone took out the 60s, Bill Graham and all that stuff, we would jump it into the 90s. We named it Volume, a couple of other silly names at first, and then Scott Paulson Bryan uh, named it. He said, let's go with Bye. He said, man, I love it. I'm with you. I think what we saw as you know, this tremendous opportunity with Vibe was to create something that really was the cultural chronicle of record. Um, all respect in the world to the source and what the source was doing before that, but, you know, they didn't have the budgets, they didn't have the experience. Um, what they were doing was a different sort of a project. They start to put together a team for the, the editorial team that eventually becomes Vibe. And there was not a, a large community of us who were out there writing about hip hop at this time. There were sort of the same handful of faces. We would all see each other multiple nights a week. We were going to the same shows. We were going to the same nights at the same clubs. Um, you know, I would go out and I would see Kevin and Scott and Joan. And, you know, we, we all knew each other. We were all sort of the handful of people who were doing this for these different outlets around the city. On Vibe Magazine's debut issue, I was asked to contribute an article about Rocksteady Park, and which is where I grew up. Not being a member of the crew in the 80s, but being there on a daily basis because I played ball. Simultaneously, that hallowed ground was known to the basketball community as the Goat Park, named that the Earl Manor Goat, the playground legend. So that was my contribution. Retelling sort of these parallel universes in basketball and hip hop to the Vibe audience for the first time. I assumed when I graduated that I was gonna work at a woman's magazine. It wasn't until I saw the test issue of Vibe, which came out in the fall of 92, that I was like, oh my gosh, like 
this is where I need to work. This has everything. It's not just hip hop, but it's R&B and urban music in general. And it's um, more than just the music. It's the culture, it's film, it's fashion. And the journalism in this magazine was just on a whole other level that I was so impressed by. And the photography was crazy. Like that stretch cover was like, what is this? So we were so we started doing, uh, you know, other magazines had done their their power issues or their richest issues or whatever it was, and so I think in the I can't remember if it was in the second year of our history we started doing the juice issue in September. September is obviously sort of the biggest was the biggest magazine month. That's when there were the most fashion launches. I mean, the famous the September issue for Vogue was like the the marker for all magazines. So we made that our big special issue for the year. And coming off of the year that Bad Boy had, we wanted to do Big and Puff as the cover for the Juice issue that year. It reached a point though where the tensions between Death Row and Bad Boy made every decision so charged that you know if we're covering death row if we're covering tupac you know it's seen as slighting bad boy you know and those political realities i think were behind keith reaching out directly to puffy and saying look we're gonna put you and biggie on the cover i'm gonna make sure the piece comes out right i've got this hand-picked guy he's gonna do the piece so this was perfect you had this hip-hop uh, beef between these two uh, alpha males, you know, going at it uh, from different coasts. It was an action movie. So, of course, yeah, people got paid off of it. Um, I hate that that Biggie's mom had to go through what she went through, you know, losing a son. I hate that Afeni Shakur had to go what she went through. And I've hate that everybody in the in the industry had to learn a lesson through this one of the things that became very clear to me was that just like there was a generation of boys who were buying the magazine there was a generation of girls if you will who needed a magazine too honey magazine don't get it twisted was the brainchild of Kierna Mayo and Joycelyn Dingle. We shopped it, we dreamed it, we crafted it, we studied it, we planned for it, we shot for it, we spent every dime we had. Um, so it was ours, but we didn't have a million dollars walking in the door and that brought us out of the business of the publication. Why do y'all want to do this other magazine? You have Essex. So that was, you know, after we got over the insult of it, we figured out how to strategize around it. What we were doing at Honey was, and, and at our meetings was trying to be very clear about the fact that black women have buying power, um, black women have layers, and that, you know, this is a market that you should support. We love Essence, but you know, Honey was not Essence. And um, we had a lot of proving to do that all black women don't need this one magazine. We need 10 magazines. It was Honey Magazine that made me sit up and go, what's this? That actually got my attention more, probably because as a woman, I'd never seen a cover like that Lauryn Hill cover. It touched me in a way that made me want to, I read every page of that. At, at, I could tell you from the honeycombs to every single piece in that first issue of Honey, that to me had more impact for Karen Hunter than anything that I've ever seen in Source or Vibe. Honey did that. Um, and I to the point where I had to know who, who are these women that, who did this? Honey was a Black feminist magazine. We didn't know it was, but it was. Um, I mean, they have like Audre Lorde in there, but then they have Mary J. Blige in there. You know, Honey was the magazine where Erica Badu said she is going to sit on our porch with a shotgun and wait for a man to come home. Honey was also the magazine where Karen Good wrote an essay just about Black women's shapes. 
you know, Ayanna Bird interviewed uh, Lil Koi Moon, aka Lisa Bonet, about where she had been. And um, when you think about Kieran Mayo and Joyce Lynn, um, Dingle and that whole Honey staff, Honey was probably one of the illest magazines ever made, ever. That was nothing but Black woman love. After interviewing over 60 writers, we realized we couldn't just do a documentary. So we smartened up, opened the market up. I mean, only now do I know we actually made an impact. And I say that because we didn't do very basic things that you should do if you want to preserve a culture. Or if you want to be the person who defines what the culture is and who tells you what was actually happening, you can't do ridiculous stuff. So we did ridiculous stuff. Well, not we. I mean, some of the people who had power did ridiculous stuff. Like, for instance, nobody ever bound the source. The source is just people have sources in their bag somewhere, or, you know, I have a bunch in a box somewhere. So we didn't bind them. We haven't put them online. I really do want there to be like a real archive of this work. The burden of the story is these subcultures are now appealing to and being collected by the artifacts are being collected by top universities and museums that's the story it's 40 years after the first uh punk rock records were made it's 35 years since the first rap records were made and you know finally you know these august institutions are um confirming what we've always thought which is we didn't just make hits we made history now I gotta go all the way to Cornell University to see my main man, Bill Adler's archive. But not only is his archive there, they have a whole hip hop collection. They've been doing the work. There are five universities with hip hop archives in the United States. Cornell and Harvard's being the most popular. But shout out to William and Mary with the heavy collection of history from the good folks from Virginia. It's love day. I'm showing everybody love, B. Fab Five Freddy's joint was just acquired by the Schomburg in 2019. <laughs> to archive and preserve hip hop in such a way that it will last forever. Forever? Forever, ever? Forever, ever? It's important to digitize and provide access so that we can democratize our history, avoid the situations of the past. to preserving their work and their lives, shaping their own narratives, come to the gates preserved.
Um, so you can follow Cyrita Gates at um, Cyrita Gates um, on Twitter. Thanks, Kai. Uh, hi, um, I'm grateful too. Thanks a lot. Um, I was kind of um, distracted because I had to look up the Skomberg Center for Research in Black Culture um, because um, those cinched institutions are necessary and um, from a European perspective, kind of new. And um, I love the presentations, all the, three of all the three of them, and especially the movie. Can we um, pose any questions having looked at um, this? Is anyone interested in commenting, asking questions? Go for it, please. Um, I would really love to ask Jamie something, actually. Um, you know, the work you're doing is always so inspiring, but, you know, these projects that you showed us today, um, I was fascinated by the way that there was a, a kind of physical component. Uh, you know, you had that event where you had people reading from the, the fictions and the poetry and so on. And I just wondered how... Um, so in my work with the desktop documentary format, we're thinking about starting a, a kind of uh, desktop documentary film festival and we were thinking you know as it is so focused on the laptop screen do we do we just make it a, a kind of website where people can interact individually but having seen your work and also thinking about Sirita's work where she organizes events where food and, and drink are a big part of the event um, I'm wondering if kind of watch parties or, or trying to build in a lived element, you know, after two years behind the screen, um, I just, I was really inspired by, by seeing the live aspect of what you're doing. Uh, thank you. And I just want to just put it out there. Sorry, my sound didn't work and we did the sound check and I just must have left myself on mute. So I want to apologize. Um, one of the things is, you know, thinking about like, witnessing and being together there's something that is so important to be physically present in some of these like presentations and uh, when i had taught an undergrad course on digital storytelling and culture i had i taught two sessions and at the end of the semester i rented our local nonprofit theater and we rolled out the red carpet and so the undergrads got to see their final projects like on the big screen and there's something about watching it together and you know as a documentary filmmaker like it really like the premiere you can see people like you know cringe or get weepy and you know different things that i think when we're making projects we want an emotional connection and i feel like in the presence it's easier to kind of watch people's reactions than to see a text or a message chat response to what you've what you've produced and so i think if there's any way to do some sort of like a live launch and invite people it's you know great fun i remember in minneapolis participating in a five by 24 film festival <clears throat> which meant you had 24 hours to make a five minute film and then basically you ran <clears throat> your final project to a gallery and they screened it at this gallery and so we got to watch and vote on each other's productions, but it was like, I don't know, a competition I've never been a part of. And, and it, until then, it was so much fun bringing a team together and staying up all night. And, and so you think about the experiences that we do, even in creating what you're saying, like your desktop documentary projects, like then to bring it to life in like a certain liveliness in, you know, human presence, it's kind of a a big fun deal, so. Please raise your hand and maybe um, talk to us. We wouldn't mind. Um, if I'm correctly informed, we've still got plenty of time, right? Because we started at three, um, three, um, Central European time, so other times for others. Good morning, <laughs> the US. <laughs> but the sun's gone up, Jamie, as far as I can see, at least. 
<laughs> yep, the sun came up and my partner took the dog for a walk and that was just me and wearing a dress shirt, but pajamas underneath. <laughs> so. um, but you might want to grab coffee um, and we can take a pause of two minutes if you like, or five. But otherwise we can we can go on asking questions. Um, we, um, um, I'm, I'm pretty sure that um, very many historians are with you on s such or similar projects, right? Because uh, this is um, in the um, limbo between archival science and uh, history um, storytelling. And uh, it's an approach that's been discussed uh, a lot uh, with German historians as well. Um, and I'm and I'm glad that you, as um, information studies professors, um, accept that. And then it's not only about the written, but about the spoken, about the presented. Um, and um, I will forward this idea to my colleagues around here, I guess. And um, desktop documentary, it's it's already around. I've been uh, told about that as well by other sources. By the same token, you know, if there are no questions from the audience, we can always uh, take some time away from our screen uh, and uh, and wrap up here. Yeah, why not? Let's have another look at the participants list. No questions, no raised hands. Um, perhaps I can ask a question to James. Um, so while you're doing these wonderful things, uh, I'm thinking about the, the stories you have created, captured, and that needs to be uh, preserved as well. Um, have you guys looked into a certain set of tools, standards to use to create the digital stories, or is just kind of left to the individual creators? And yeah, so I'm, I'm thinking about the technical side of digital preservation here. Yeah, I guess I was really interested in, in what Jamie was doing to preserve um, the, the content that um, is coming out of those projects. Um, but for me, I mean, we don't, um, I haven't been thinking so much about technical standards, but we've, I've been trying to center using free tools in my work and in my teaching in this area. So I've been making a lot of use of the Night Lab suite of products. So it's Night with a K, uh, but they've made a lot mm -hmm. of material that is um, free to use. And I've also been um, trying to work with virtual reality um, a little more. And um, although I haven't found any free tools that are, are particularly helpful um, with that, but there is like, there are free trials of, of um, software that you can use for kind of 90 days and, and develop a project out of that. So uh, Yulio, Y-U-L-I-O is one that I um, mm. have, have worked with. Um, but I haven't yet got to the point of thinking about um, the preservation of these products. But I, I felt that Jamie in your work, there was already some thinking about the archival aspect. Yeah, we're building the archive and also working with um, our UA libraries and their digital research repository. And um, when producing digital stories, I like to think whatever you can get your hands on for the students to produce things, it's okay. And I'm always inspired by Kirby Dick, um, who made Chain Camera, which he gave um, like, what is it, eight millimeter film cameras to students and they just started documenting their everyday lives and so my thing was like whatever you can get your hands on old media new media like let's just start telling stories and so you know that's something one of my colleagues zach lisher -Katz, does a lot on like digital curation and preservation and so uh, we have a, a shared laboratory space on called critical archives and curation collaborative and so we continually talk through ideas around preservation and also in the production, do we think about preservation while we're producing? So kind of, you know, shifting the timeline on how we how we think about the full, I think, cycle of media. And um, I also wanted to um, 
Actually, I'll pause there. Okay. Um, that's another um, aspect um, that we could learn from um, this night lab um, um, place. Um, I visited it and um, I, I had learned about it before. Do you think that students like undergraduate, no, well, um, how, how, how do I call it? Um, students at high schools can actually develop their own stories. I mean, this is a, a new um, um, way for, uh, for, for teachers to um, have them um, do something else than um, scientific texts. Um, I think uh, um, others might have uh, learned that as well, but um, right now we, we, we do have AIs that, that can make scientific texts. So there's no chance of getting any, or finding any plagiarism because a machine wrote the text. So this is becoming devalued, right? And um, desktop docu documentaries might be uh, a new option to gain real insight if our students have learned it. Sorry about my English. Um, sometimes it might be difficult to understand what I'm saying. And I just have um, one thing to add about um, preservation. And I've been inspired by professors Ken McAllister and Judd Riggle, who founded the, the only circulating video game archive, I think, in the world. And their big thing is preservation through play. And so they say, if you're writing about video games, you can't just you know, write about what you know, you have to actually experience it. And so they, you can call them up and say, can you send me this particular video game? And they ship it and they help you learn how to play it. And then you kind of have that pr preserved embodied piece about playing. And so that's been, I think, really uh, like shifted my ideas about how we understand the body and connecting it with archives and memory. And so I think in terms of like preservation too, like building relationships in doing, you know, these oral histories and digital storytelling sort of workshops and working with people, I think we build a sort of way to preserve that often gets overlooked. All right, so um, this, my, will be the wrap up, I guess. Um, and you're close to you're, you're, what you said um, is, is close to a closing remark, and um, I don't want to um, 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 bore anybody. So, this is the end of our um, session. Um, please enjoy iPress for uh, what is uh, still before you. And um, thanks a lot for listening, for your comments and questions. And um, I hope to see you someday at a real iPress. I was that close to getting to Glasgow, but didn't succeed um, sometimes. Um, that doesn't really work, but um, I'm glad that this virtual way of um, talking about things exists and um, that we've succeeded to make an iPress a hybrid conference. That's really great stuff. So enjoy your day and um, thanks for getting up so early to the US guests and um, 